So hello everyone, welcome to Drug School. I am your host, Adam, and today I have the pleasure of introducing to you Alex Barker, and today we're going to get a little personal on Drug School because we're going to talk about your career, or what my career used to look like. Um, I When I did this interview, I got the uh, misfortune of not only just becoming the uh, interviewer, I became the interviewee. So um, Alex is a life coach. Um, he, he teaches, um, he coaches pharmacists and pharmacy technicians on things they can do to either improve their careers or um, ways to change the outlook on how they see their existing career. And I'm kind of on this little bit of a, a mission to um, prove that there is life beyond retail. And there is life beyond retail. I mean, we have hospital pharmacy, you have managed care, which is what I do. Um, you have oncology, which uh, we had Jacob uh, interview about a couple of months ago. And if you haven't watched that video, um, I'll put a link up there for you. Um, the The whole premise behind this episode is to really get yourself in the right frame of mind to either make work enjoyable again, um, to remember why you got into this career in the first place, or maybe... Um, it gives you a chance to think about ways you could change your career. Do something a little different. Be a little different. Gain a new skill. So with that, welcome to Drug School. We're glad to have you. So, uh, welcome back to Drug School. Um, I'm Adam, and I'd like to welcome Alex Barker. Alex is the author of Indispensable, The Prescription for a Fulfilling Pharmacy Career, and he is also founder of The Happy Farm D. And Alex, it's a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you for doing doing this and taking time out of your uh, evening. Um, at least it's evening here. And I will attempt not to cough through this entire interview because... Uh, with the change of Michigan weather, my allergies kicked into high gear over the weekend. So, um, well, thanks for having me, and and I feel your, your pain as a fellow Michigander. It, it's a season for us. Yes, it is. So, I, in full disclosure, I bought the book. Um, so Alex did not pay me to plug this, and um... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> So uh, if you haven't gotten the book, I do encourage you to go get it because there is a lot of great information in there. And one of the first things that stands out, almost one of the first pages out of your book, is that pharmacists rank 14th out of 482 careers that the CDC tracks, 14th in suicides. And you get fired up about that statistic. I've heard you fired up. I heard you on Retail Pharmacy get fired up about that. And um, shout out to Mitch D, too, or Mitch Lee, too, because um, I've been listening to his podcast now for several commutes home. But um, so what's going on that's causing us to be this depressed? You know, I, w I wish it was like one answer. So at the top of the list is dentists uh, for the highest suicide rate. Well, if we stop biting them. <laughs> that would help, I'm sure. But th that's a part of the reason why, right? Why do you go to the dentist? Well, for most people, it's because you're in pain, right? Um, in a pharmacy, that's not always true. You know, you don't go to your 
your pharmacy all the time because you know you're mad about high blood pressure. That's just something that you do. Um, there are unfortunately a lot of reasons why we are in the state where we're in. And unfortunately, there's not really any great data to suggest how things have changed over time to influence mental health. But I think if I was to paint a very broad stroke and hope and make lots of people probably angry, I would have to say it is a psychological problem, one that comes from a lack of purpose, being that I think most pharmacists enter the profession because we want to help people. And when we get into our jobs, we find that that seems to be very little of what we do. It's not our purpose. And there's a, mis there's a mismatch between the job and the company and what we want to do. And that disconnect causes all sorts of things, whether it be infighting, complaining, job place, uh, I don't know, misplacement, ne workplace negativity. And I think depression, anxiety, and even suicide can be related to that ultimate fact. Because I've, I've never really met people who felt like they were really in their zone of genius all the time and not be uh, or, and, and be depressed about it. Um, usually there's some sort of unmet expectation that's not flowing well. And so that's my broad stroke answer is to say, I really think pharmacists, many of them feel misplaced in the workforce. They don't really feel close to the fact that they're helping others, but obviously for all the suicides that are tracked, I mean, you know, there's probably a myriad of other factors that led them to that unfaithful moment, but that's the short answer, I suppose. And I don't know if the CTC actually tracks technicians in this in the same list, or they brush, they brush us in the same category as pharmacists. But I, I've met a lot of of technicians too, and and we we go into the career much for the same reason. Uh, we really want to help people, and um, I remember uh, my first. I think it was within my first month at the three letter chain. Um, <laughs> many years ago, um, mm -hmm. I was told I care too much and I kind of got the feeling I was in the wrong place at that point. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of, of pharmacists go, they, they almost treat their jobs like it's the instructions on the back of a shampoo bottle. Rinse, slather, repeat. It's like basically, you know, eat, pharmacy, sleep. I, I think I actually have that as a magnet on my <laughs> marker board at work. Um, yeah. I, and I think I got it from Ferris, actually. Oh, hey. <laughs> Go Bulldogs. Um, I just did a quick search for you while you were talking about that. The CDC actually doesn't track cause of death for pharmacy technicians, which is really interesting because... Uh, I, I think there's twice the amount of technicians in the United States in, uh, in comparison to pharmacists, right? There's, I think there's like 500 or 600,000 technicians. Something like that. And I, I know in Michigan, we're, we're in our 20,000s for licenses now. Yeah. So that's a huge amount. Um, you think they would be tracking it. Maybe we should, you know, I don't know, get some awareness going because I'm certain there's some trends there to be watching out for. So when when you get into that mindset that it's basically, you know, eat pharmacy sleep or rinse lather repeat. I mean aside from the the psychological depression because I know I was in that place not too long ago personally speaking. So I I kind of come from the same level of experience. So I I I'm a technician of about 11 years experience now actually be 11 years in two months. Um, and you got to, when I went out to look for a new job, because it was just basically, I'm in rinse, lie, the repeat mode. I was just in survival mode. Yeah. What What is the next step for somebody outside of looking for a new job? Because you not only have to look for a new job, but you, I mean, you probably are in that point, but what, what kind of mindset do you need to make do with the environment you have? 
I, I don't mean to flip the question, but do you mind if I ask you, how did you get into this new job? Um, I found it accidentally on um, Indeed. So, <laughs> um, so I got on Indeed, and uh, I work for a company called Health Plan Advocate, which no one's heard of. Um, in fact, when I saw the job posting, I had to do like six Google searches just to make sure the posting was legit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I quite literally was like going on their website and going, okay, is this company for real? I mean, does this place really exist? And I actually found myself walking through their office building on a Saturday afternoon, just making sure that the place actually existed. Smart. <laughs> Smart. Before I hit the apply button. And, um, yeah. But um, I had probably gone through easily 15 interviews before mm -hmm. I got to this one. And, and, it's, and it's because I was already a technician practicing at the absolute top of my license, getting paid an ungodly sum of money. So wherever I was going, I was going to take a cut in pay. Yeah. That was almost a guarantee. Um, yeah. But um, actually, I ended up getting a raise in this one, so I kind of ended up ahead. Congrats! Um, <laughs> but um, what? So aside from making do with your current situation, you may have to come to the realization at some point that the career your your career path may actually have to take a step backwards in order to move forward. Have you ever seen a pharmacist or a pharmacy technician actually do that, where they actually go, okay, I'll take a slight cut in pay to actually do right. something I really enjoy? It happens a lot. Uh, there's a lot to unpack with that idea um, because what holds most pharmacists in the position that they're in, uh, that I've come across, uh, I'll, I'll be upfront with you. I've only coached two pharmacy technicians in, in careers. Um, so most of my experience is in pharmacy, but there's simple truths, no matter what your profession is, because I've coached doctors and dentists and chiropractors and lawyers all on these things, which is golden handcuffs, right? You get into your job and you think, well, I make this much money. There's no way I can break free from these change because even if I make $5,000 less, I'm not gonna be able to pay my bills. So I think there's a lot of financial things that uh, reasons or excuses really that hold people in the position that they're in. Um, but I have worked with people who have taken $20,000 pay cuts to do work that they actually enjoy. And here's the funny thing about that. I want to make it very clear that there was a, there was a post on LinkedIn where someone had commented on the fact that Alex, you know, that's great that you're trying to help people, but we live in the real world. And that means that I can't, you know, I'm the sole breadwinner. I can't take a 20,000 pay cut to do what I love. And I sympathize and I totally get their situation that they put themselves in. But the problem that they do, well, actually not the problem, but the opportunity that they don't see is that when you are in a job that you love, when you are doing things that you enjoy, you actually find probably new opportunities to pursue. So for example, case in point, the very thing that you and I are doing right now, Adam, is we're talking right now on your new thing that you are trying to do. This is a new opportunity, new endeavor, something that could or is currently, I don't know, making you potential side income. I would venture a guess that as a technician in your previous job, you wouldn't even thought about putting your extra energy into something like this, where we're hanging out on a Monday night after a full day work, both you and I. True. So, and, and two hours of grad school. I got two hours of grad school in tonight, too. Okay, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, so we're, that's another thing. But the point being that when you are in that new job, even if you are making less money, you probably have more energy to pursue new and interesting things. And maybe that's not for you. And maybe you say, well, I don't want that. I just want my work to be work. Well, it's, it, I guess it comes down to what is your health, your sanity, your psychological health, your mental health, your your relationships, what are those worth to you? Because uh, I, for every burned out person that I talk to, uh, I can almost guarantee that one of the aspects of their life is unfulfilled, unmet. It's leading to things like divorce. 
I've unfortunately talked with many pharmacists who are divorced, have kids, they're fighting with their spouse, they're fighting over kids, they're fighting over the house. Um, and it's almost a certainty that the job is a part of that equation that led them to that moment. You know, what, what is your family? What is your sanity worth to you? I don't think anyone would put a dollar amount on anything to say, well, keeping my family together is, it's worth $20,000 a year per year. Um, you know, they don't say anything like that. Your family, your happiness is infinitely more important than the salary that you make on a yearly basis. But if you think to yourself, well, man, if I could, if I could be doing work that would actually make me happy, um, you probably should consider thinking about making a career change. Do you want me to answer your first question though? Because that was a much different question than the one that you just asked. That's true. It was. <laughs> um, That's okay. But it was so, a question about mindset, right? Yeah. So when you're in survival mode, you, I, I. I, I spent some time with a career coach. Um, okay. About a year, a little, little over a year and a half ago. Um, and w there's a lot of uh, her. Her mindset was uh, trying to train, retrain your brain into a different line of thinking. Mm. And. What I ended up taking away from that, um, aside from the fact that was I was truly in the wrong place, um, that I was really truly in the wrong place, was that um, she was also trying to teach me how to like make do with what I have, and and when you're in survival mode you kind of like don't have the energy to make do with what you have. So how do you get, it's been a long time since I've seen the first days of school when I was in the college of education, many, 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 many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I graduated with my undergrad in 2002. Um, but um, they talk about you, survival. You take a breather for that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't show your age you look good uh, i shaved off the gray yesterday oh, okay. um <laughs> and i'm small enough on the screen right now that um it doesn't matter um <laughs> but um so when you're out when you're in survival mode how do you rebuild that energy to like make it through until you get to that next step in your career. Cause, cause ultimately most people aren't going, especially pharmacy technicians are not going to be in that place where they can just, I'm done with right. my, with my, with this, I, you know, screw this. I'm out of here. So they're going to have to make do with what they've got. How do they do that while they're trying to pursue a new passion? There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, pursuing a passion. How do you make do? Changing a mindset. Um, really, I think it all comes down to uh, awareness. If you aren't aware that you're burnt out, if you're not aware of a problem, then it's very hard for me to even pinpoint where the mindset is because most likely it's probably a scarcity mindset. It, it sounds like the coach helped you identify that you were coming from a place of uh, maybe, maybe I, I hate putting words in your mouth, but maybe like victimhood thinking like I'm in this, I'm in this situation, not from my own fault, but other people, right? My boss is the problem. My team is the problem. Uh, my husband, my wife, my family, like they're the ones that put me in this situation. It's not my fault. Um, that's where I think a lot of pharmacists are. Uh, it's where I was when I was burnt out. Like my, my boss sucks. I hate her guts. She makes me feel like crap every single day. And I don't know how long I can do this. Um, rather than, you know, taking responsibility 
from where I was, I, I wanted to just blame everyone else, even people who were my, you know, work allies. Um, but it took some very insightful words from a mentor of mine to pinpoint, hey, there's some faults here in your logic. And I suppose that's the magic of a career coach is being able to listen uh, to where you're at and helping you probably pinpoints the lies that you're telling yourself. Cause I'm sure when you were in those moments of like, I don't know, I just want to make through today. You weren't telling yourself things like you could, you can go do something else. Right. Which is a truth. You could, cause you approved it. It is a truth. You can leave your job. You can go pursue something more interesting, a simple truth. But yet in the, in that moment, you weren't believing it. You were believing some other lie that told you just get through the day because that's all you can do. That's all you have the energy for. Um, a lot of what I do when I work with people one-on-one -on -one is typically identifying lies that are hidden in, in partial truths because technicians are a little bit different, I find, but pharmacists uh, by and large are usually um, reserved, introverted, and over-analytical, and, and um, sometimes micromanagers. And we, we typically don't like putting ourselves out there and, and taking a risk on things. Um, and that makes us poor networkers and it makes us poor uh, people person sometimes. Not, not all the times we're generally, you know, we work well with people, but we, we have to because we often work with the public. But I identify the lies like that all the time. And so to your original question, like what, what are the things that you can do is probably identify where you're at. And if you don't believe that you can transition into a new job because no one's interested in you or you don't know the right people. Well, I, frankly, I believe those are lies. And I think it's about identifying them and hopefully believing some new truth and taking action on it, which it sounds like you did, right? You, which by the way, just a quick side note, uh, the market for pharmacy technicians is completely different than pharmacists. And we actually are in shortage right now. Exactly. There are so many cool new opportunities I'm getting. It's very interesting from you know my business standpoint, because mostly I just focus on helping pharmacists, but like there is a huge demand for new and interesting jobs. And that just means, you know, your salaries are gonna go up and up and up and up. So, you know, there are opportunities out there. You just got to uh, do some new and interesting things not just looking on like monster.com because that's, it's a great place to start, but it, you're competing with tons of other people. I, I just not a strategy I recommend, but anyways, getting back to the point, probably acknowledging things first and then dispelling the things uh, that you know to be untrue. Absolutely. You actually answered my next question. I actually okay. had a list of questions for you. <laughs> And you actually answered the next one while you were answering that one. And I was going to ask you how <laughs> you read my mind, Alex. Um, I was going to say how a career coach helps solve the monotony. And um, you answered that by saying you have to take inventory of, of the lies you keep telling yourself on a daily basis. And yeah, uh, it, <clears throat> I have a coach. Okay. <laughs> I, I drink the juice. I'll be honest. I have a coach and there's tons of stuff that I'm doing that gets in my way from pursuing new and bigger and cooler things. So I notice it in our professional organization, because if you look at the way I, I, I serve on two boards at the Michigan Pharmacists Association. And um, I notice in the way that our, our, even our own professional organization manages itself it's very reserved it's very cautious um it's very reserved and i th i think that that's true of pretty much any professional organization in healthcare outside of doctors and, pharma. <laughs> and, and yeah. big pharma and big pharma yeah um yeah well, think about who they attract, right? Decision makers. Right. People who are willing to make a decision and look stupid or willing to get haters 
that's not pharmacists. If you actually look at like our personalities as studied by psychologists, by and large, we are uh, worker bees. We want to be a part of a hive and a system and guidelines, and we all want to follow the code. We do not like being the ultimate decision makers. What's so interesting, you, you, I, you may find this really funny. I, I recently learned this from a psychologist and pharmacist named Dr. Uh, Austin Zubin, um, that the uh, countries of Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, I believe one other country, where pharmacists, uh, they got provider status. By and large, the majority of the pharmacist population in all of those countries did not want to do the things that provider status gave them. <laughs> and it was, it, it's really funny that you mentioned that because I was listening to, uh, it was an interview I was listening to on a podcast at work. Um, I forget the name of the podcast now and that violates a lot of podcast code, but um <laughs> That's okay. Um, he was interviewing a pharmacist from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, pharmacists north of the border have prescribing rights. They, they can flat out write you a prescription if they want to. They won't. <laughs> in, yeah. in, fact, in, in fact, this pharmacist made it a point of, I could write you a prescription, but then I have to take liability for it, and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> right. Why I do so, it's not in our nature. It, it hasn't been for mo uh, hundreds of years. Um, I do think it's a major problem. You know, we, our associations treat it as the holy grail. And I think it is something that we, sh I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying we shouldn't chase after provider status. I do think there will be pharmacists who do that, but once we get it, uh, it the adoption is not going to be great. Um, plus, I mean, the business models aren't established yet. So I, there's yeah. barely any pharmacist entrepreneurs anymore. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a fair point because I, I think in my 11 year career in pharmacy um, in, and Grand Rapids is not a small town mm -hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. Grand Rapids is, 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 you know, second largest city in Michigan. Um, population of the county is about half a million people. When Grand Rapids, when I first started, Grand Rapids proper had nine independent pharmacies. We now have, uh, for a very short period of time, we were down to four. We now have five. Um, one of my former colleagues opened her own pharmacy um, uh, on the opposite side of town to be a competitor to the one I was working for. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, so I actually call her on a regular basis because I usually need help with something. But um, it, it, it just surprises me that you touch on a point that there, there's so few of us that are actually entrepreneurs that could be. Right. And it doesn't, and it doesn't have to involve owning a pharmacy. No, no, it doesn't. Um, in fact, how I got started with my platform was talking about side hustles, um, because there was much more freedom there and less liability than starting something like a, a pharmacy business, right? Mm -hmm. um, it goes against the pharmacist's nature to do something that could end in failure, and. If you wonder why, well, think about what we do. It's all about not failing. Because if we fail, someone could die or get hurt. Um, so doing something like business is very difficult. When I, I, in the beginning, I used to coach pharmacists who wanted to start businesses. And I quickly learned I had to stop it. I, I, I had to say no more to it because they would start something and then they eventually would lose steam. And I kind of was racking my brain like, why, why is this happening? Like over and over again, people are seeing success, but they give up. And I found that it's usually because they get to a glass ceiling and they think, well, I've got this much success. And if I, if I, if I, if I do more, like I could fail, like, well, what happens if I get 10 customers, then I could really let people down. 
And so I said, okay, I'm only going to be coaching people who like have well-established businesses and they've been in, they've been doing it for a year because it just, it got frustrating to me. I mean, as a coach, I want to be, be able to say, Hey, look at these people I've helped. They've, they have, you know, high six in figure businesses or seven figure businesses. Uh, you know, I help them grow it. I don't want to say I helped, you know, Sophia pharmacist start a Etsy store and now she's making, you know, a few hundred bucks a month. Hey, wait, yeah, cool. But you know, she may give up on it anyways way off topic yeah entrepreneurs we're not we're not great entrepreneurs <laughs> it's possible but we're just not wired that way not not too many of not too many of us have business degrees that go with our pharmacy degrees <laughs> yeah but i mean even then i mean i don't have a far or i don't have an mba and i never will get one i mean i don't think it's valuable for what i do but my, my bachelor's is in business by the way <laughs> business education do you <laughs> use it half the way <laughs> hey, well that's good that's good i can crunch the numbers hey i know my program makes money <laughs> good well that's good which means i can continue to have a job <laughs> hey. well, that's, that's job security for you good so um we're about out of time because i try to keep these to about a half hour oh, um, okay fine <laughs> <laughs> we could talk all night about oh, the various things. Actually, I did want to talk to you about one thing before we go. Uh, okay. One of the things that you did with a pharmacist, um, you pointed it out with Mitch, and I think if I remember correctly, I saw it in the book. You talked about a pharmacist you helped get into medical writing. Mm, yep. I was actually shocked at how low the requirements are to get into medical writing. Yeah. Uh, you don't need anything. <laughs> um, I mean, it helps to have a medical degree, but you actually, uh, you... I have a, I have a 2000 page medical terminology book sitting up there from when I teach it at Baker, but yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, that's it. That's not at Baker. I actually know that's cool. Uh, my wife went there. Um, Oddly enough, but not as a technician, uh, theater arts, that kind of thing. Um, no, yeah, you, you don't need much. Um, you just need a medical degree and hopefully a decent writing ability. Yeah, it was, it was, it was surprising. Um, one of the other certifications um, is what I'm actually hoping to eventually maybe append to my master of public health is um, there's a board certification in patient advocacy. Mm. that doesn't have an education requirement attached to it yet yeah here here's a secret that academics are not going to like um the only reason why we have degrees now are because a bunch of really smart phd people said hey we need to tell we need to make standards here and we need to make money doing it. We need to make a lot of money doing it. And so now uh, what's happening, and I'm really happy to report this, is that multiple schools, mainly technology schools, are creating these wonderful programs for very, very, very low cost and teaching extremely valuable skills where people are getting very decent jobs. And I really hope they disrupt the entire system because what we have is ridiculous um i don't know it sounds like you have multiple degrees and and i'm sure you're in quite a bit of debt um, <laughs> as i was graduating from pharmacy school graduate I will, school I, I i'm not in debt yet oh I will, okay I, I will be i will be next year uh, um <laughs> okay well i mean regardless you're doing really well for yourself then um but you know it's a pretty penny to pay and uh the truth is, is that like it happened in pharmacy just recently. We, because uh, IT is so new to pharmacy, uh, they started requiring PGY2 and now three, PGY3 programs for residents to get into IT. And um, these things are just not needed to get your hands dirty. 
it takes practice and skill and experience. It doesn't require these certifications and these programs. Yeah, this is a bad question to end the interview with because I, I get so frustrated by this permeated belief that in order to get into something, you need a certificate. Yeah, it helps, but you know what? I just talked to a pharmacist the other week. Oh no, a couple uh, last month. He had a certificate in information technology, and no one she had spoken to found it valuable. So. Uh, Get your hands dirty, you know, build something, go help something, go help someone in a hospital system. Gosh, do something of value. Don't just sit there passively and get a certificate. I feel like I just heard Mike Rowe speaking. Mike Rowe? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love Mike Rowe. I love Mike Rowe too. Um, <laughs> so, so, so my degree, my degree, uh, my undergrad degree was a, I have a, this is the longest major name that you'll ever hear. Okay. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in secondary vocational education in business. Is that about, so you teach business school at tech school? Is that the job? Just so, to... so the certification is, the, the final certification when you get it from the Michigan Department of Education is you you graduate with a k-12 certificate i could actually if i wanted to go renew my teaching certificate from 2008 that it expired in 2008 which i could barely do now um you could go teach L elementary. i could teach elementary all the way up to 12th grade um you don't want to do that no not anymore um i no. I uh, teach post-secondary now. It's much nicer. Yeah. They're, they're paying to be there, and if they don't pay attention, you don't care. Right. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Uh, imagine paying for something and saying it's valuable. Gosh, yeah. Another subject for another day. But, but, um, but what, what strikes me as a vocational educator is, is I'm there to teach you a set of skills that you need. Mm -hmm. So when I teach Baker, Baker College as a prime example, I teach a lot of the freshman health science classes. So I teach the found because I don't have my master's yet. Um, I can't teach anything above a 200 level yet. Um, so I'm stuck teaching all the 100 level classes. Sure. Um, my class is introduction to health professions. And my my overarching goal when they get out of there is they have to understand what they've gotten themselves into <laughs> when they're done. So I teach, mm -hmm. I teach stress management, um, dealing with the difficult patients, yeah, complying with HIPAA, which everybody finds out of or so electrifying. I actually teach it with a mad TV video. <laughs> Nice. Go, YouTube, YouTube it. It's called Mad TV, the old pharmacist. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it's Miss Sylvia, and Miss Sylvia is absolutely hilarious. Committed every HIPAA violation in the book <laughs> in four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, well, Alex, I do uh, appreciate you having you join us. Um, yeah. You offer a master class that's you, you give do. a freebie. Uh, I do, but hey, actually, uh, let me let me let me do something special for you right now. Uh, get this hot off the press. Um, I know that you you can go get this book if you wanted to. This is what it looks like, indispensable. I just got this in the mail. It's hardcover, really expensive, but I'm giving the book away for free. If you go to uh, free RX book. Dot com. I'm not doing any of those weird promotions where you got to pay for shipping and handling. I'm just giving the digital book away for free. Um, my hope is that people will give back. They'll. Uh, I'm donating all the proceeds of this book to charity. So if if you love it, if it's helped you, even if you're not a pharmacist, there's some good stuff in it. My audio editor, who is not in pharmacy, said there's some really good stuff in it. So I think you could benefit from it as well. But uh, 
Uh, I'd love it if you check it out if you go to freerxbook.com and you and can I'll get put it a free. Link in the video description. Cool. Love it. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Alex. And and, and again, on Happy Farm D, there's also that free master cl that free class that you offer as well. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's about uh, pharmacy transitions. Uh, it's, it honestly, though, is mainly geared at pharmacists, but uh, I think anyone can still benefit from it. Absolutely. Well, Alex, thank you for taking the time out of your Monday evening for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Alex Barker.